Well, howdy, New Spring. Everybody doing good today? Ready for Christmas? All of our campuses, those watching online, joining on the podcast, uh, those watching on a pirated YouTube video. I, wanna, I just want to welcome everybody here today, and I just want to start out by asking this question. How many people here on all of our campuses have ever had what I like to refer to as an oh crap moment? How many of you ever had an oh crap? Now, maybe you don't say crap. Maybe you say darn, shoot fudge. Okay, you got to be remember great Christmas story movie. Oh, fudge, but I didn't say fudge. Anyway, I, I love that movie. It, um, we, we've all had those moments where we have an oh crap moment. An oh crap moment is like, oh my gosh, this isn't turning out like I thought it was going to turn out. What am I supposed to do? Um, I want to invite you into one of my um, oh crap moments that I had this week. Um, it, here at New Spring Church, and many of you know this, but some of you may not, um, we take weeks if not months, planning the services that we have. And we do this for a couple uh, reasons. Number one, we want to honor and value your time. We know that um, you could choose to go to another church or or not go to church at all. And so we want to make sure that um, we dotted our I's and crossed our T's. And and so we plan our services and pray through them. Um, We believe that God is a God of planning and order. And so we want to honor him that way. The second reason we do that, um, I guess the main reason we do that is because we want to give God our best. And every time we try to give God our best, um, it always, you know, just works out. And so what we typically do is I bring in a creative team and we work through a passage of scripture and I get a woman's point of view and, a man, you know, singles and marrieds and older and younger. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun because when I get up here and try to communicate, I, I need as much help as possible. And, and everybody knows that. So um, we had a message. We, we planned this series called The Journey. And on this day, what it was going to be really cool is um, a friend of mine named Ari from Israel, and I've told you about Ari. I'm told the church about him. He's the godliest man I've ever met in my life. I love this man. I love him so much. And him and another guest were going to come from Israel, um, and we were going to be able to sit on the stage and talk to um, our church about the the investment that we've made in a church in Israel and what's going on over there and some really cool stuff, and everybody was going to want to go to Israel after that talk, I promise. Um, And so we we had made those arrangements because I'm, you know, preparing for like a squillion Christmas services next week, and we got some stuff going on there. And so um, I got an email from Ari and from my other friend in in the Middle East, and they said, "Um, hey, man, um, pray for us this week, and this was like on Tuesday, they're expecting a snowstorm in Jerusalem, and they're calling this like the monster storm or whatever. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm going to pray. Um, I didn't, so that's probably the number one problem is I didn't. You know how you tell people you'll pray for them, and you run in them five, to, five years later, they're dead, and you forgot to pray for them. So I, uh, don't judge me, you've done it before. And the only time I'd ever seen it snow in Jerusalem is when you buy one of those little snow globes and you shake it upside down, and that, so I was like, okay, whatever. Um, I got, I was, so I was at the office on Friday. I was at our, um, at, um, our central offices and I was working on some things and kind of polishing some things up. And I got an email and a text message from our friends in Israel saying, uh, in fact, one text message said, Hey bro, um, I've got two feet of snow in my driveway and don't have a four wheel drive. We're stuck. And, uh, so what we had planned for this Sunday wasn't going to happen. And, and I literally had this thought, Hmm. We don't have a message for Sunday. I'm the preacher. I need to preach a message Sunday. I don't have anything prepared. Oh, crap. And so that was my, my oh, crap moment. And, and it's just, um, I mean, it, that just happened 48 hours ago. Now, for some of us, we've, we've had moments like that, like we go to pay um, we realize our wallet's gone, and we're like, oh, crap, my wallet's gone. Somebody stole my wallet. Or, or worse than that, our cell phone's gone, and people freak out over lost cell phones. I do, too. Um, but, but maybe it's more serious. Maybe your oh, crap moment um, in the past few weeks, months, even past few years have included your spouse telling you it's over. You didn't plan on that. Maybe it's included the doctor calling you and telling you that you need to come in, or they need to talk to you about your mother or your father or even your child. You didn't expect that. Maybe um, you're upside down in your finances because of a job loss or bad decisions and you got a bill on top of a bill that came in with another bill and another late payment. And what I know about every person in this room is we've all had our fair share, and for some of us we would argue our unfair share of oh crap moments. And life in those times and in those seasons can seem to be 
completely overwhelming. I was shocked and saddened um, during the question and answer uh, thing that Clayton and I did a few weeks ago. Do you know that somebody asked a suicide question in every service? People are overwhelmed, stressed, freaked out, anxious. I know of three pastors that have taken their own life in the past month. And it's because one oh crap moment builds on another one, builds on another one, and builds on another one, and people lose what I believe Jesus came to give us just about more than anything else in the world And that thing's called hope. You know that hope's a universal language? You don't even have to be a Christian and want, and you can want hope. Non Christians, Christians, men, women, doesn't matter age, race, economic status, everybody wants hope. And the darker it seems to get, the more light we want in our life. And even if it's only a glimpse, even if it's only like a little bit of light, we'll run towards it because in the darkness, everybody seems to want to run toward the light because in the light, this is all we know. There's some kind of hope there. There's some kind of source there that I don't seem to have in my life right now. And everybody seems to want hope. Well, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, I love you and I'm so glad you're here. But I love you enough to tell you the truth. There is no hope for you in this world apart from Jesus. Everything in this world is eventually going to let you down. This world cannot deliver on its promises. And I'm telling you, apart from Christ, there is no hope. But I also want to talk to people today who are Christians, who are in Christ, because here's what I know as a follower of Christ. Sometimes I lose hope. Sometimes, as a Christian, I have what I call a multitude of oh crap moments that I wish they didn't take place in my life. And I know you do too. And I know there are people here today that for church we put on our smiles and we spent some time in the mirror this morning getting right. But I know there's some people here today that the past season of your life has been filled with the unexpected that turned into the unbelievable and we feel overwhelmed by the circumstances that seem to be crushing us. And so today, from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, if you have a Bible and you want to go there, I want to share with you three reasons I believe that we can have hope. If we're in Christ, I want to share three reasons that we can have hope. And if you're not a Christian, these are three reasons that I believe you can eventually have hope. Number one, Because Jesus is not afraid of our mess. The first reason I believe that we can have hope today is because Jesus is not afraid of our mess. Now, we live in a messed up world. Our world is messed up. Nobody's going to argue with that. There's political corruption. And let me stop. Let me be straight. Both sides of the aisle, okay? Both sides of the aisle. I'm an equal opportunity offender. There is corruption on both sides of the aisle. You're not going to find no preference here. I'm telling you, it it exists. We've got political corruption. We've got economic corruption. We've got people fighting at Walmart on Black Friday to save $20 on a TV. And we have honey boo boo. I'm telling you, we live in a messed up world. Nobody's arguing, nobody's going, no, no, man, our world is perfect. But as messed up as our world is, I want you to think with me for a second about the ancient world. 2,000 years ago, it was messy. And it was messier than it is today. We're going to talk more about this in a couple weeks, and so I'll just um, kind of hit this. But in the ancient world, babies, if they were born with a birth defect, or if they were the wrong sex, were taken out into the river and drowned. Widows were fined for outliving their husbands, and women were treated as second-class citizens. Might made right in the ancient world. In fact, in the ancient world, there were basically two problems. There was rebellion and religion. Rebellion. Rebellion was when people said, 
We're going to do what we want to do. We don't care if there's a God. We're going to live our own way. Religion was where people said, hey, you know what? We want to try to be really, really good people. But you know the more religious somebody tries to get apart from a relationship with God through Jesus, that their life gets just as messy as the rebellious person? And so God looked down and said, there's rebellious people and there's religious people. And you know what rebellious people and religious people have in common? They're both messy. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to run from the mess. Like husbands, when you get home, you walk in the door and you hear your wife talking to your kids and she goes, ugh. What do you do, guys? You go, you're like, I think I just got a call. I think I just got a call. I got to go fix something. I got to go replace the engine, baby. I got to go rebuild a transmission. Or if you have a friend that gets sick and projectile vomits everywhere, what do you do? You don't go, oh, come here, hug time, hug time. Like you're like, whoa, and you kind of leave your friend standing there. But God, Jesus, don't miss this. Jesus looked down at our mess. And this is what blows my mind. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, just the first part of verse 18 says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Stop. That's the only thing that you learned in church today. That's enough. You know why? Because this verse right here tells us that Jesus saw our mess and didn't run from it, but stepped into it. We have a God today that's not afraid of your mess. We have a God today that's not impressed with your religion. We have a God that that has a son named Jesus who looked at us and said, rebellion isn't the problem. Religion isn't the problem. The problem is the rebellious nor the religious have a relationship with God. And Jesus knew that he was the only way for us to have that relationship. So he stepped down from heaven into our mess. And when when we put our mess in the hands of the Messiah, somehow he takes our mess and turns it into something beautiful in his time. That's the Jesus we have and that's the Jesus we serve. Now here's what's amazing. Jesus stepped into the world and when Jesus was born on Christmas, the world was still messy. He didn't make things right immediately, but he made things right eventually. And that's the kind of God we have. He may not make things right immediately. In fact, today, If you give your life to Christ, or if you give a set of circumstances to Christ, when you leave, guess what? Those circumstances are waiting on you at the door when you walk out. And sometimes they grow fangs. Everybody thinks, as soon as I give my life to Christ, everything is going to go away. No, 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 no. If I put this situation in the hands of Jesus, it might just disappear. No, no, no. He, He might not make things better immediately, but you give him time. Because he always makes things better, eventually. We've all been messed up. My gosh. Look at the person next to you. It's a messed up person. Some of y'all are like, I knew that. I knew. Did you listen to this? My wife is in this message, so I've got to be careful with this next illustration. But um, several years ago, we were in the, we were in the restroom, and I was getting ready for bed. I took off my shirt. And any time I do that, she just goes crazy because... Sometimes I just want to cuddle and be held, and she doesn't understand that, and just want to talk about my feelings. And she's probably going to meet me when I come up on stage and go, "I'm going to give you that opportunity for the next week." And so that is going to be anyway. She saw this spot on my back, and she said, oh, you've got a spot on your back. And I was like, well, you know, that's okay. Everybody has spots on my back. Why we got to talk about the spot on my back? Why don't we talk about the spots on your back? Why you got to judge the spot on my back? And she was like, shut up. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so she was like, you need to go to the doctor. You need to go to the doctor. You need to get this spot checked out. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And I never did. Well, um, for six months, she told me, you need to go get this checked out. And I didn't go. So finally, she conspired with somebody in my office, and it got on my schedule. And before I knew it, I'm sitting in a dermatologist's office. The dermatologist comes in. She looks at it. She goes, oh, you've got skin cancer. I went, oh, crap. She said, no, no, it's not serious. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not serious because it's not on you. (laughs) She's like, I think we can treat this. Let's just put this cream on it. And so we put this cream on it. And uh, she said, I think it'll be better. Now, that's what we do sometimes with our problems. 
we go to Jesus and we kind of feel like we get a little Jesus on it. We're going to pray about it. We're going to put a Bible verse on it and it'll just get better. But my problem was I didn't follow up. And I got a wife that asked me, did you follow up? Did you follow up? Nope. 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 I just didn't follow up. So about a year, year and a half later, after I put the cream on, because it went away, I think it was all right. Spot came back, bigger and nastier. She's like, you have got to go get that checked out. I didn't argue with her a lot, a lot this time. Went to the dermatologist's office, the dermatologist says, okay, we're going to try the cream on it again. I put the cream on it again, cream didn't work. Went back. She said, we're going to have to do a biopsy on this. Did a biopsy. Called my wife. I came in from work several weeks ago. My wife told me, sit down on the couch. She said, they called me from the skin cancer place today, and the skin cancer is deep, and the good news is they can get it. The good news is it's not melanoma. The bad news is you're, it, this is going to be a little ugly. So I thought what I would do today is sh show you a picture what it looked like. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I know some of you have very weak stomachs, and uh, like in, in scary movies, you'll close your eyes, and so I'm going to tell you when I'm going to put the picture up. I'm going I'm to count to three, and then I'm going to put the picture up. Keep your eyes closed. Close your eyes. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you're, I, don't send me a stupid email saying, well, that just sick. You know, I'm going to sick. I told you to close your eyes, dummy, all right? I, I don't, I don't want to hear it. I told you. Told you to close your eyes. And listen to me, don't open them until I tell you to open them. Because you got a friend next to you that might think it's funny. Hey, look, uh, no, no, the picture's not up there. And then like the person in front of you is going to get hit in the back of the head with your projectile vomit. And then if you go, a lot of other people go. And so I just need you to trust me as your pastor. Now, some of y'all are like, I can't wait to see this. You got your phone out. You're going to take a picture. But if you get grossed out. I'm telling you, close your eyes and don't open them till I tell you to open them. I'm going to put the picture up on three. One, some of you need to close your eyes right now. Don't play with temptation. <laughs> Two, three. Keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. 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 I saw you peeking. Keep your eyes closed. Now I'm going to move that. And you can open your eyes in three, two, one. Now, for those of you that had your eyes closed, think Blackberry Cobbler. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, what, what was a not big deal on my back turned out to be a, a spot about this big. And you know what? The cancer's gone. But you know what else? It's not better. It's going to take time. It's not going to get better immediately because the wound has to heal, but it'll get better eventually. Messy things, when we put them in the hands of Jesus, may not get better immediately, but they will get better eventually. Saying that, let me ask you this question. What in your life is the most messed up that you simply need to put in the hands of Jesus? Maybe you have messed up finances. It's always good to talk about that this time of year. And I'll talk to people with messed up finances, and I'll ask them this question. Have you tried putting God first? Have you tried tithing? And they go, well, I tried that, and it didn't work. How long did you try it? Two weeks. Mm-hmm. You wanted God to make it better immediately, and God wanted to make it better eventually, and he wanted to make it better through your faithfulness because when a little bit of our faith intersect with his faithfulness, amazing things happen. Trust, and hey, this is Christmas. There is no better time to start giving something to Jesus than on his birthday. How many of you pay your bills online? Come on. Did you know you can give online? just want to throw that out there. Maybe it's your marriage. You have a messed up marriage? Here's what I know about people with a messed up marriage. People with a messed up marriage will respond. They'll go to the care room. They'll pray, and then they, and then they expect everything to be better. They've had problems in their marriage for 10 years, and they want it to be better in 10 minutes. Hey, you know what? If you'll give your marriage to Jesus, if you'll give your relationship problems to Jesus, it might not get better immediately. But in the hands of Jesus, it gets better eventually, and it always turns out better than we thought it would. You having problems forgiving somebody? You're about to see him this Christmas. 
You've tried to put it in the hands of Jesus, but you keep taking it back. I'm telling you, put your mess in the hands of Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, put your life in the hands of Jesus because he is not afraid of our mess. He came to die for our mess, to take away our mess, and he will not run from you. In fact, many of you are here today because he's been running to you, asking you, put your mess in my hands and I'll turn it into something beautiful. Number two, second reason that we can have hope is because with Jesus, nothing is impossible. Nothing. With Jesus, I get fired up about this. If I had an organ player behind me right now, I would just go a little, I mean, I'd start waving a red, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, some of you have no idea what that's about and you're better for that. With Jesus, nothing is impossible. And I'm gonna ask a question and if you're sitting with your parents, it's gonna get a little weird. Okay, how many of you know how a baby is made? Would you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, yeah, no, come on, raise them high. My gosh, <laughs> no, no, you weren't doing this when you, all right, so, so, so. Now, if you're sitting with your mom and dad, that's weird, but it happened at least once. Some of you are like, no, happy place, happy place. <laughs> I was freaked out when I found out how babies were made. Because for years, I honestly believed when I was a kid that women got pregnant because they took Geritol. <laughs> There's a story behind that, but I literally, and I had a friend correct me. He said, no, no, women don't get pregnant um, because they take Geritol. They get pregnant because um, their husband pees on them. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I would see a pregnant lady and be like, her husband peed on her. <laughs> he needs to stop. That is not nice. But the way babies are made today are the same way that babies were made 2,000 years ago. And they had figured it out 2,000 years ago. They know how babies came about. But think about Christmas. When we celebrate Jesus born of a virgin. Let's just read this next text because this is beautiful. Watch this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. This is amazing. Let's keep going. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after she had considered this, or after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The birth of Jesus is a miracle and it's a reminder to us that nothing is impossible. Think about this for a second, because I started thinking about going through the Bible and all the miracles that happened in the Bible. And if you grew up in church or you know anything about the Bible or church, we can talk about miracles all the way from the book of Genesis, all the way to the book of Revelation. And, 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 and the Bible is full of miracles, and I have no problem with miracles because I believe God is supernatural, and I believe God can overcome anything. Um, and so I don't have a problem with miracles. But there's some people here that you're like, well, you know what, Perry, I've got a problem with some of those miracles. I don't believe God put an interstate highway through the Red Sea, and I don't believe the walls of Jericho fell and I don't believe all that stuff hey that's fine let's just start with Jesus the bookends of the life of Jesus I'm not asking you to believe the entire Bible today I'm asking you to look at Jesus the bookends of his life are a virgin birth and a resurrection and anybody that can pull off a virgin birth and a resurrection I'm following that guy because nothing is impossible here's the good news about Jesus All he knows how to do is win. He does not lose. He doesn't even have a defense on his team. All he does is run up the score, and nothing is impossible. I don't care how difficult your circumstances are. I don't care how difficult your situation is. He is greater than any circumstance or situation that comes against us. Nothing is impossible with God. 
nothing. See, that pumps me up a little bit. See, here's where, he, here's where he's crazy, though. Perry, you don't know my situation. You don't know what I'm in the middle of. Virgin birth, resurrection. The problem that you're freaked out about, Jesus is not freaked out about it. The problem that you're going through, Jesus isn't worried because he knew what you were going to go through before you were even born. And he made arrangements not for you to walk around it, but to walk through it with his power in you because nothing is impossible for him. That's it. That's it. Some of you, the reason you came to church today was to hear this. Nothing is impossible. You're going to make it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Nothing is impossible with God. See, let me push on this before I go on to the last point. Some of you have friends and family members, and we talked about this last week. We talked about going from red to green, that we need to do whatever it takes to get people here for a Christmas service. I'm telling you, we went to Israel, we filmed. It's going to be the greatest Christmas services we've ever had in the history of our church. And people are going to meet Christ. And listen, they might not meet Christ next week when you bring them. See, we want God to do something immediately, and maybe he wants to do it eventually, but maybe next week is their next step. See, God might not make all your problems go away today, but if we'll put him in his hands, not immediately, but eventually, the Bible says he makes everything beautiful in his time. So I'm asking you to go to one more phone call, one more email, one more text. One, hey, don't just tell them about the Christmas service. Take them to the Christmas service and let's watch what Jesus does. Because some people, he will save them next week. And some people, he will start the process. Either way, he gets the glory. Because with him, nothing is impossible. There's never been anyone he cannot reach. So I know about your uncle or your aunt or your cousin or your friend. And in your mind, you're thinking it's impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. Which leads to point number three. The third reason we can have hope is because Jesus always fulfills his promises. Jesus always fulfills his promises. Always. Not sometimes. Not, all, not part of the time. Always. All of us have had promises made to us. We've had people over-promise and under-deliver. For mine and Lucretia's 10-year anniversary, we went to a place that their website promised a bunch of things that when we got there, the location did not deliver on. Spacious room meant horrible room, right? Beautiful scenery meant smelly volcano nearby. I mean, it was horrible. But then some people, you've met people that underpromise and overdeliver. But the problem with us and God is sometimes we think he's forgotten about us because he doesn't seem to be coming through on his promises. See, in the ancient world, to the Israelites, Jesus was born in Israel. There was what they call 400 years of silence. That page in our Bibles between the Old Testament and New Testament represents 400 years. God had promised them a Messiah is coming, a Messiah is coming. Isaiah said a Messiah is coming. Ezekiel said a Messiah is coming. Jeremiah said a Messiah is coming. Micah said a Ma Messiah is coming. All through the Old Testament, Messiah is coming, Messiah is coming. And all of a sudden, seemingly it goes silent for 400 years. And people, listen, here's what I know about that time when God seems to be silent. That's where we tend to doubt the promises of God the most. And there's some people here today, and you're doubting the promises of God in your life, and you're doubting the promises of God in your life because it seems like God is incredibly silent. You pray, and nothing's happening. You're reading your Bible, nothing's happening. You go to church, nothing's happening. And you're like, God, if you don't, if you don't move soon, God, i got to find some relief. I get it. Been there. But as we talked about in the series... And Job, many years ago, and like our friend Jeff Henderson reminded us back in May, just because God seems to be silent doesn't mean that God is absent. 
Because there's a promise in Scripture that he'll always be with us. And he'll never leave us. And he'll never forsake us. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 17, that his Father is always working. We have a God who does not sleep. And we have a God who doesn't take a day off and who has not rested. God has never given up on us. And just because he's silent doesn't mean he's absent. Because he always fulfills his promises. Watch this. Verse 22 says, all this took place, the birth of Jesus, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Jesus is proof that God always comes through on what he said he would do. And he said to us that are in Christ, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you and I'll always be with you and I'm greater than what you're going through. And for those who are not in Christ, he promised us that if you will put your life in his hands, that he will take your life as messy as it may be and turn it into something miraculous that you could never imagine because all he does is take messes and turn them into the miraculous. And he always comes through on his promises. Um, to end with today, I just want to tell you a story. And I want to tell you a story about how I've seen this practically happen this week. Because I know there are people here today, and you're in the middle of circumstances that are completely overwhelming. And you just need, to, you just need hope. You feel like, you just feel overwhelmed. Several years ago, I met a gentleman by the name of Zach Smith. Many of you will know of Zach. You've seen his story on, um, here at New Spring. Zach and his family, Mandy, and their kids, three kids lo- relocated from Colorado here to South Carolina. And Zach was a genius in the IT world, just brilliant. And um, Zach fit in on staff just fine, and he was doing a great job, but... He started experiencing some pain in his back and went to the doctor. The doctor told him, uh, yeah, you've got, you got cancer and we're going to have to operate. And it was pretty serious and it was pretty aggressive. So they took him in. They did an operation on Zach. They brought him out of operation. And me and Lucretia went to see him. It was, it, was, it was a bizarre hospital visit for me because I never had this before. I walked in the room and Zach was just kind of laying there. And he always kind of had this half grin on his face. And I was like, hey, Zach, how you doing? He was like, I'm waiting to fart. <laughs> Don't get mad. I'm quoting Zach, all right? I, I, I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry for a second. I thought you said you're waiting to fart. He said, I am. I was like, can you tell me why that's so important? He said, yeah. He said, they said as soon as I fart, I can go home. Everything that's in here, they took it out. They fixed it. They put it back in. And they said that, that a fart is what I need. And I was like, Okay. I said, literally, I said, Zach, how can I be praying for you? And he said, you can pray that I fart. <laughs> I've never prayed for that in my ministry, in my life. I've never prayed for it since. But I put my hand on Zach's belly and I asked God to let Zach fart. <laughs> I don't even have a verse for that, all right? But God came through on his promise and Zach came home and they thought they got the cancer. But the cancer came came back and it came back pretty aggressively and in May of 2010 Zach went to be with Jesus several days before Zach died I was in his living room about four days and Zach said Perry I don't think I'm ready and I was like what do you mean you don't think you're ready I mean you know Jesus he said yeah yeah but God told me Perry I know God told me I know God spoke to me and told me that Mandy his wife is supposed to go to Israel And he said, why would God tell me that she needs to do that? And I'm not going to be able to to do that, to take her. And I was like, well, Zach, maybe God wants to take her, but maybe he doesn't want to take her with you. Maybe he wants to take you home and take her to Israel and it's all good and it'll all work out in his time. And God would never ask you to do something and not give you the means to do it. And he was okay with that. And a few days later, Zach died. I've never forgotten that. And it came back up this week because Mandy 
his wife actually joined our staff. She's still on staff today. She works in our children's area, does an amazing job. But just this week, as the result of some people getting together and being incredibly generous, we were able to let Mandy know that when the church goes to Israel in March, Mandy is going to get to go. And hold on, it gets better because her oldest daughter is going to get to go on the fuse trip in July because of the generosity of others. You see, Zach thought, my wife needs to go. God said, your wife and your daughter need to go. And God didn't do it for Zach immediately, but he did do it eventually. And it was better than Zach imagined because that's the kind of God we have. So if you're here today and you're lacking hope, take your mess, put it in the hands of Jesus and watch him do the miraculous because that's who he is and that's where we can plant our hope. Can can we stand on all of our campuses for closing prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every man and woman here today. It's just overwhelmed, God. Life, marriage, money, circumstances, a past, a present, just full of messy moments. God, that you would speak so clearly in this moment right now. With heads bowed and eyes closed on every campus, we have staff and volunteers that would love to pray with you or for you about what you're going through. If God spoke to you today, here's the good news. You don't have to walk through what you're going through alone. We're here as a church to help you walk through that. Maybe, maybe you're in that dark place. Maybe you, you're not seeing God work immediately and you're having a problem thinking that he'll work eventually. Right now on every campus, if you, if you feel like God spoke to you and you need someone to pray with you or for you today, I just want you to step out of your aisle right now and I want you to go and I want you to walk out the back door of your campus because you don't have to go what you're going through alone. And don't look around to see if people are moving because they are. They always do. I want you to go right now. Every campus, I want you to go. If you need someone to pray with you about a friend or a family member that you want to bring to church next weekend, I want you to go right now. If you have an addiction, if you've had a habit that's held you back for so long, I want you to go right now. If you've got problems in your marriage, you've got problems in a relationship, you're having problems releasing bitterness, I want you to go right now. If you if you need to give your life to Christ, you're not even sure where you stand with Jesus, I want you to go right now. Dozens of people in this service are moving. If you're in the balcony in Anderson, you step out those doors and you come down the steps and we've got staff members and volunteers that want to pray with you or for you because there is no reason for you to leave here today with no hope in your life. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, rose from the grave. He is alive today. We're celebrating his birth. We're celebrating the fact that he came once and he's coming again. But until then, he's with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He is God. He is here. He is in this moment moment and he's calling some of you he's calling some of us come right now you just once again one more time every campus you go father in the name of Jesus thank you for the hope thank you for the peace thank you for your promises thank you that you're always with us thank you that you have not forgotten us and thank you that even though we can't see you sometimes God you are faithful you are at work and you are doing things that are greater than we could ever imagine. We love you, and everybody in the church said amen. Amen. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you at our Christmas services.